As 2019, and well, the entire decade wraps up, it's once again time to reflect on the games that we played over the course of this year. It's important to remember that, as is our tradition, this isn't your typical yearly list that you tend to see elsewhere. We played a bunch of games this year, and most of them weren't the latest and greatest. Some of them might not have even been that good, but they all left an impression on us in one way or another. So let's get started. These are the games that we played in 2019. When former Rare developers Playtonic Games brought Ukulele to Kickstarter in 2015, N64 fans came out of the woodwork to support the project and records were shattered in mere minutes. But when the game was delivered in 2017, the reception seemed a bit less enthusiastic, although I generally figured it was just the usual case of people forgetting how to love old fashioned games. So when I finally got the game for a Nintendo Switch this year, I resolved to judge it for myself. And ultimately, yes, the game does feel a touch rough around many edges, particularly camera and controls. Whether time, budget, or the Unity engine is to blame, I don't know. But regardless, I feel Ukulele accomplishes what it set out to do. It's a game about poking your head into every corner, finding things, and figuring out how to get those things. Ukulele gives the player five huge worlds to explore. Yes, only five, but each world has quite a lot of content and can be expanded to have even more to do after a certain number of PGs have been collected. The world expansion is an interesting mechanic, although I did wish the worlds were just fully featured from the get-go. After a rather slow start, I found myself really getting into a groove of the game. It's extremely non-linear and generally does not guide you to acquire necessary or useful moves before attempting to go for particular items, which I actually found to be a refreshing change of pace over Ukulele's main inspiration, Banjo-Kazooie. I found Banjo to be much less replayable than many other N64 games in some ways because it's almost too perfect. Ukulele is much less afraid to let you approach a situation in a way that feels wrong and allow you to succeed while doing so. For example, maybe you already unlocked an ability that lets you skip part of a challenge, or perhaps you're missing an ability, but you find a way to brute force your way through part of a level anyway. It's this sort of flexibility that truly brings me the feelings of nostalgia, a flexibility that games like Mario 64 and Goldeneye excel in, while Banjo-Kazooie felt almost too carefully planned out. So despite what you may have heard, Ukulele is still worth playing. Just don't forget what it's supposed to be. Little did I know that later in the year I would be playing Playtonic's next game, and that it would bring the Lizard and Bat duo back for a radically different game. A game that makes me very, very happy. Ukulele and the Impossible Layer is Playtonic's updated take on the old Donkey Kong Country style of gameplay, and if you know me, the DKC trilogy on SNES is just about the pinnacle of platforming to me. Anyone who tries to tell you that those games were just about the graphics are dead wrong. And the more recent DKC games by Retro Studios, I won't say they're bad, and I'll admit I kinda like Tropical Freeze, but they do not adhere to the game design sensibilities of Rare's trilogy in the slightest. In contrast, Impossible Layer feels like where Rare might have taken Donkey Kong Country in the Wii era had they not been bought by Microsoft. Mind you, it's not exactly the same as the game that inspired it. The level design feels more focused on exploration than rhythmic rolls and bounces off chains of enemies, although there is that kind of stuff too, and the mechanics are excellent. So it feels like the natural evolution of DKC by many of the very same people who made it, rather than a straight up copy. Contributing to that feeling of evolution is the absolutely delightful overworld. 
At first, I expected this overhead exploration and puzzle solving section of the game to feel like a chore that would kill the game's pace, but it turned out to be one of my favorite parts about the whole thing. It really ties everything together in such a cohesive way that makes Ukulele and the Impossible Layer feel like a fully realized sequel that is so much more polished and fleshed out than the original. I actually haven't quite finished the game just yet. The impossible layer itself can be challenged at any point, and while playing through the rest of the game makes the layer much more possible, it's still pretty difficult, and longer than I expected too. So I still need to get back to attempting it, but I still had to include the game on my list because it has absolutely been one of my top favorites of the year. <laughs> One of the most anticipated crowdfunded games to date finally released in 2019, four years after its very successful Kickstarter campaign, Bloodstained Ritual of the Night. But the long and tumultuous development, along with some unimpressive early previews, seemed to foster a sense among the public that Koji Igarashi's long-awaited Castlevania spiritual successor would almost certainly fall well short of the hype. But having beaten the game myself, I'd say that those reservations were unfounded, and if anything, maybe they fueled the team to finish strong. And while the Switch version has some difficult technical issues that it may never totally overcome, anyone playing on other platforms will find an excellent experience. What I found so striking about Bloodstained was not simply how well it evokes the feeling of a style of Castlevania game that we haven't seen since Order of Ecclesia in 2008, but really how successfully it serves as a spiritual successor to 1997's Symphony of the Night in particular. There's an undirected openness about your approach to exploring the castle, and a welcome mystery and obtuseness about how to proceed beyond dead-end endings on a handful of occasions. I swore to you that I would stop you if your Shardbinder power ever manifested itself against your will. You made the same oath to me. <gasps> Please! You think I wield this power unwillingly? This is not a game that holds your hand, tells you what to do, or where to go. You find your own way, and the game gives you just enough information to figure it out, but you do have to pay attention to small details. While the Game Boy Advance and DS Castlevanias have some of those elements too, the particular ways in which Bloodstained reminds me of Symphony of the Night have only served to increase my appreciation of both games. It's clear that Igarashi spent a lot of time reflecting on not only what made Symphony of the Night and the Castlevania games that followed so well loved, but also why Symphony of the Night was still generally considered to be the best of its ilk. Metroidvania, or whatever you prefer to call them, has become such an overused genre in indie gaming today, a style of game that I still love but feel a bit weary of at times. So it's been really special seeing one of the master producers of the genre return and show us how it's done with a new game that, in my opinion, equals his best works. Originally released on Xbox Live Arcade in 2012, I finally played the widely acclaimed Dust and Elysian Tale via the physical release on Nintendo Switch by Limited Run Games. I knew very little going into the game other than it was mostly made by one person, is apparently good, and the characters were animals of some kind. I expected to probably like it, but I found myself much more taken by the game than I expected. The main draw here is the combat. It's just a lot of fun, with most encounters pitting you against large numbers of enemies that you can fling around the screen however you wish. The mysterious protagonist, Dust, is extraordinarily powerful, and the game does an excellent job of making you believe he really could take on endless hordes of monsters and soldiers as a one-man army. Well, a one-man army greatly assisted by his small orange flying companion, Fidget. Dust has your basic XY attack combo system, but it's not overly complicated. Fidget casts small spells that Dust can magnify with his whirlwind blade attack, 
which can really rack up the hit counter for some nice bonus experience. It might look chaotic, but it's actually quite manageable overall. But when you do get hit, even on normal, it tends to really hurt, so I wonder how tough the game is on the highest difficulties. RPG elements are solid and don't feel tacked on, making for noticeable jumps in power as the game progresses. Exploration looks Metroid-esque at a glance, but areas are sectioned off by a world map, and overall I would compare it to something more straightforward like a Vanillaware game than Metroid or Castlevania. My biggest complaint with Dust is that the character art has a somewhat amateur look to it, with a very basic inking and shading style, feeling rather like something you'd see in an early 90s CD game, Although, to be fair, I kind of got a working designs vibe from the characters and writing, so maybe that's what the game's creator, Dean Dodrill, was going for. My name is Dust, and this is Fidget. Hiya! Don't mind Mr. Grumpy. He's not big on the whole eye contact thing. Dust himself has excellent animation, however, and the backgrounds and environmental effects are quite beautifully rendered. Despite expecting a good game, I got more out of Dust than I thought I would. Even though this is technically a last-gen digital download title, it still holds up great in the areas where it counts. The start of 2019 was all about unfinished business for me. Heading into the year, I had a couple of games in progress that I felt were necessary to wrap up. The first of which was Sega's Fists of the North Star Lost Paradise from Ryo Ga Gotaku Studio. I hope I pronounced that right. You know, the developers of the Yakuza games. This was my first time diving into one of their games, so I wasn't quite sure what to expect. I have a faint memory of seeing the Fists of the North Star anime on TV in the 90s. It had an amazing look to it, but it was so heavily censored it was completely nonsensical. Lost Paradise is the recent in a long line of Sega developed Fist of the North Star games, or as it's called in Japan, Hakuto no Ken. The first game came out all the way back in 1986 on the Mark III, and was reskinned on the Master System as Black Belt. The hero of all the Fist of the North Star games is Kenshiro, a master of a martial art called Hakuto Shinken, which deals certain death by applying pressure to a variety of pressure points on the human body. Anybody who gets on Ken's bad side, chances are, they're most likely already dead, and it's only a matter of time before someone erupts into a geyser of blood. The Yakuza games are well known for offering a ton of side quests, and there's no shortage of that here. Although the real meat of the story takes place in the city of Eden, where Ken can take on tons of odd jobs, some to move the plot along, others are just meant to be ridiculous. For a change of scenery, head outside of the city walls into the wasteland where you can play baseball with dudes on motorcycles, or hunt for treasures like classic Sega arcade games. Despite being a man of few words, Kenshiro was the most interesting and entertaining aspect of the story. He is one serious dude, and I can appreciate that. His stoicism lends an understated sense of humor, and I love that he applies a level of intensity to everything that he does, no matter how trivial. To that end, it's clear that the developers reveled in putting Ken into situations where he looked out of place and silly, yet he still manages to excel at any given task. The other big holdover from 2018 was Resident Evil 7, which I began in early November. Ever since it was first revealed, I couldn't have been less interested in the first person point of view, but the major factor in inciting this change was the release of the PlayStation VR headset, and Resident Evil 7 was poised to be the killer app. When I finally got myself a PSVR in late 2018, that's when I figured it was finally time. Well, this is horrifying. One of the scariest movies I've ever seen is the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's not so much the violence, because there's very little of it actually on screen, but the tension combined with the grime and filth that covers everything gives it a uniquely unsettling and imposing aura. RE7 taps into this, but playing in VR takes it up several notches, where it suddenly stops being fun in a traditional sense, and becomes a mentally exhausting experience, which I suppose is the point. That's cool. 
<laughs> Mind if I take a little spin? Okay. <laughs> oh, jeez. Okay. With those two commitments wrapped up, it was about time for me to take on one of 2018's most anticipated releases, Marvel's Spider-Man. So I gotta say that few genres bore me more these days than open world. I'm so sick of giant maps with busy work icons strewn haphazardly across a map and would much rather have a clear progression that unfolds naturally. What I'm saying is, give me Arkham Asylum, not Arkham City. But the praise for Spider-Man was insane. The timing seemed right, but it just didn't grab me. It didn't help at all that I found the character himself to be pretty mundane in recent years. So I quit and moved on to something else. Ah, uh, just kidding. One chilly Saturday afternoon, I took my kids to see the animated Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse movie before it left theaters. And it was crazy good. It totally revived my interest in the character, and that night I returned to the game and was completely invested until I reached the finale a few days later. What a turnaround, right? In my eyes, an open world game lives and dies by the way that you move from mission to mission. Insomniac Games has done an excellent job with the sense of scale and your ability to move through the environment, making you feel empowered to explore. It's fun, and more importantly, fast. It never feels like a chore to gather collectibles on the way to your next destination. And the detours are only as long as you want them to be. It's cliche, but you really do feel like a superhero. And then we have Tetris Effect, a game that drew rave reviews upon its release in 2018, but presented a bit of a conundrum for me. See, I'm a fan of Tetsuya Mizuguchi's more action-based efforts, such as Rez and Child of Eden, but his puzzle games, such as Luminous, eh, they never really seemed to rope me in. So when I saw that he was doing a Tetris game, it could go either way. I like a good falling block puzzler, but I rarely ever put in the time required to get good. But, whoa, this is a breathtaking experience. The light and colors form in the shapes in your periphery, while the sound and music lull you into a trance. Tetris is no longer a game, it has a life of its own. The soundtrack is absolutely incredible, I just can't get over it. You feel the music in this game more than any other that I can think of. The last level of the journey mode really showed me how little I understood about Tetris. I guess I just didn't fully understand how things fit together and what patterns I was looking for. It was a humbling experience and it took me a lot longer than I'd like to admit to finish. But then, I kept going. And going. This is probably the last Tetris game I need or want because I'm not sure if it could ever be topped. With the word of mouth surrounding Control this year, it might seem a bit odd I chose instead to play Quantum Break for my Remedy fix. I've been a fan of theirs since the first Max Payne, and even though I don't tend to play their games on day one, I haven't been let down by anything with Sam Lake's involvement yet. I came back home to see my best friend, Paul Serene. He wanted to show me what he'd been working on. My brother Will was a scientist. He was also involved. Paul said it was world-changing. He was right. Coming off the supernatural high of Alan Wake, I was interested in Remedy's take on time travel. Quantum Break had a prolonged gestation period and released to a muted reception and quickly faded away. It's an extremely ambitious project, melding a game with a live action TV show. I was surprised at how these two things only crossed paths a couple of times, with the show focusing on characters that are more off to the side of the main story. Liam. The use of the two storytelling mediums immediately annoyed me because of the time investment required to actually start the game. Now, I'm fine with that, but just don't plan on starting the game the same day that you first put the disc in. That said, the story is the main reason to play Quantum Break in the first place, so I'd recommend committing to watching the show as you play. Time travel can be a mentally taxing thing when you really get into the nitty gritty, and this was a take on the subject I've never seen before. 
The method of time travel is unique and the game seems to strictly adhere to the rules that it sets for itself. Your first journey back in time, 2010. This is where our notes get hazy. No matter how frustrating it is for you and the characters, the past absolutely cannot be changed. History always plays out as it's always existed, no matter how many times the characters try to alter it, because their interference was one of the many moving parts that actually make the events happen in the way that they did. The way this idea plays out for certain characters really struck a chord with me. Unfortunately, the gameplay didn't have the same kind of impact. I've learned by now that Remedy shooters are always competently made, but this is a fairly typical cover shooter with some neat powers that spice up certain encounters. Still, the overall mediocrity of Quantum Break won't deflate me from checking out Control. Word is that it's much better, and I've heard that it even has some sort of connection to Alan Wake. Yeah, I'm into that. And then, we have Death Stranding, without a doubt the most divisive new game released this year. From its reveal several years ago, I was curious to see what Hideo Kojima was going to make when he had no restrictions or expectations. I went into the game completely dark, which I feel is probably the best approach for something as bizarre and unconventional as this. The last thing I expected was a post-apocalyptic visual representation of a Sigur Rós album. I don't know if I would call Death Stranding fun exactly, but it was strangely compelling. Only Kojima could get away with turning a game about slow-paced cargo delivery into a AAA game, but it mostly works for me. I've always enjoyed trekking across game worlds on foot, taking in the sights, and seeing if I can climb up to some ridiculous point that seems nearly unreachable. It's such a shame that after spending so long building the Fox engine at Konami, Kojima barely got to use it. Regardless, this is one of the most beautiful games I have ever played. You're encouraged to take in the sights and sounds of the world as you pass it by, and when you scale a ridge to see your destination in the distance, it's simply awe-inspiring and relieving. I really love the sound design as well. Simple little things such as the sound of BB's hands hitting the glass of their container gives a sense of reality to the world, which isn't something I can recall feeling in a game that often. Maybe. I go into a Kojima game knowing he's going to fling me around, laugh at my misfortune, and he's going to make me listen to characters yammer on and on and on and throw around crazy acronyms, and honestly, I wouldn't have it any other way. I play a Kojima game for the Kojima experience, and Death Stranding is undeniably very Kojima. And it's nice seeing him get to create a new concept from scratch for the first time in a very long while. This is about as slow of a burn as any game I have ever played. There's a lot of information you have to take in before heading out with your cargo. And it really made my head spin at first. I teetered between calling it quits and having a decent time. I was probably driven almost exclusively by the curiosity of whether or not any of this would make sense by the end. I wouldn't want to spoil the story, but I will say that by the midway point, I was totally hooked with such a bizarre setup that seemed nearly unexplainable ever since the first couple of trailers, I really didn't expect to ever understand what was going on. But ultimately, the game led up to what was for me a thoroughly satisfying conclusion. I'll be waiting for you on the beach. Come and find me. After I finished Death Stranding, I was still in the mood for another state-of-the-art technical showpiece sort of game, but maybe one that wasn't nearly so long. And as maybe a six or seven hour long game, Hellblade Sinua's Sacrifice fit the bill perfectly. The unfortunate title sounds like it came out of a high schooler's notebook and doesn't really match the vibe of the game. That there's nothing to go back to at all. Stay still, stay quiet. Their gods can see into your mind. They will use this power to destroy you. They won't stop me. Senua suffers from a sort of psychosis, and the game uses it extremely effectively not only to tell her story, but also to facilitate gameplay in ways that feel very fresh. Senua is a Celtic woman who seeks the Norse underworld based on stories she's been told by a friend who had dealings with Vikings. 
Different voices rattle around in Sinua's head almost constantly, talking amongst themselves and making observations about her situation. Some inquisitive, observant, or encouraging. Others cautious, pessimistic, and mocking. Open it. <laughs> she has to. Not from this side. Yeah, I this allows the game to feed the player information with no tutorial or HUD to speak of. It pushes the player to figure out for themselves how they can interact with the world, how they might solve puzzles, and what might have changed after interacting with a door or lever without being explicitly told. And I absolutely loved this approach. This carries over to the game's simple but fierce combat system, where the voices might help the player learn how different enemies open themselves to attack, or warn of enemies approaching from the rear. I really loved the enemy designs too. I thought they were rather frightening. And in general, the game has much more of a horror vibe than I was expecting. The recently released trailer for Sinua's Saga looks particularly creepy too. So I can't wait to see what Ninja Theory does with what I presume is planned as a much bigger game. I'm not sure I would have believed you if you told me last year that not only would I have beaten the PS4 version of Dragon Quest XI in 2019, but I would also play the entirety of its lengthy post-game to reach the true ending and I would then proceed to start it all over again and get through most of the Switch version when it released later in the year. But that is exactly what I did. I wouldn't want to spoil a thing, but if you love good traditional Japanese RPGs, then Dragon Quest XI is definitely for you. I don't think it quite tops Dragon Quest VIII or IV in my book, but I'd say it rests comfortably around the third place spot alongside Dragon Quest III. My only particular complaint would be that I actually prefer random encounters, for Dragon Quest anyway. Enemies are simply too easy to avoid, and the game does not demand terribly much from you in terms of levels until later, so as a result the world just doesn't feel dangerous, which is something I've always appreciated when roaming the fields in Dragon Quest and hoping I can make it through a dungeon and on to the next town. We win again. Luckily, with the Switch version's 2D mode, that problem is solved. Encounters are random, and battles move breezily. And while I would still say that I consider the 3D mode to be more of the true version of the game, 2D mode has been extremely efficient and enjoyable for a replay. More different than I expected, too. While event triggers largely remain the same, town and dungeon layouts tend to be radically different. Some field areas in 3D mode are actually large stretches of world map in 2D mode. And while the 2D mode's presentation does have some slight visual quirks, I'm still glad that this version of the game managed to get life beyond the Japan exclusive 3DS release. River City Ransom is one of the NES's most ahead of its time games, with such a huge degree of freedom when it comes to your approach to taking on the world. So when I learned that Way Forward, who is one of my favorite American developers, was putting their own spin on the Kunio Kun series with River City Girls, I was immediately interested. I've liked the Kunio games that I've played in the past, but a more modern aesthetic seemed like a perfect evolution of the style. After the underappreciated Double Dragon Neon, I'd basically trust WayForward with just about any beat em up series. Although I only had a chance to play it in single player, I was pretty hooked to the end. Like the original, it's much more difficult at the start until you figure out how to power up your character sufficiently. As a bit of disclosure, I actually worked on a few of the pre-release trailers for River City Girls, so I had some idea of what I was getting into ahead of time, and even still, the game was more fun than I expected. Having played it in co-op on the backloggery stream with our good friend Drumble, I might have had a somewhat easier time than Corey did. 
and I absolutely loved the stomp to revive your friend before their ghost flies away concept. Definitely one of the best and funniest co-op mechanics I've seen. It kept tension high during boss fights without making revival trivial. Did we do it? Did we do it? Yeah! yeah. <laughs> 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 Woo! <laughs> Yeah, freaking well, fight. <laughs> the combat just feels great and is complemented by truly excellent sprite animation that makes it all the more fun to dish out the pain. The worlds of Kunio and Double Dragon have been slowly colliding over the years, but it seems like they've finally committed to them existing in the same universe. <laughs> Nobody beats my prices! I got a real kick out of this game's sense of humor, but the soundtrack is the real star of the show, topping even Double Dragon Neons. And that was one of my favorite soundtracks of last generation. Like that, oftentimes the best tracks are those with lyrics, and this definitely had me checking out more Megan McDuffie's work. All these factors came together in what was ultimately one of the best beat em ups in years. <laughs> Indeed, River City Girls was just one of many retro style games that I played this year. But before we get into that, can we talk for a minute just how good of a year it's been for Sega fans? Not even taking into account the Sega Ages releases on the Switch, which I have to mention because every time Space Harrier gets ported to a modern console, I'll buy it no questions asked. But more than any other time that I can think of, there is a lavish amount of attention put on the Genesis. Despite the unfortunate sound delay issue, Sega's own Genesis Mini was a great little all-in-one console for a more casual audience. But it was the enthusiast community that truly paid proper homage to the console and its add-on's legacy. The analog Mega SG was immaculately designed both inside and out as a great standalone console for people who wanted to play their original cartridges in high definition and as authentically as possible. Terra Onion's Mega SD was able to at long last incorporate Sega's CD-ROM functionality into a flash cart. I'd say it's the most essential peripheral for Sega fans. And then you have the much anticipated Xeno Crisis, a homebrew Sega Genesis game from the UK-based Bitmap Bureau that was kickstarted in late 2017. This top-down arcade-style shooter is reminiscent of Smash TV, mixed with a Space Marine aesthetic akin to James Cameron's Aliens, and it is awesome. This is one of the largest Genesis cars ever made, and it's easy to see it on display. It's clear that the team at Bitmap Bureau know their Z80, because the sprite work is absolutely incredible, with huge bosses being especially impressive. The soundtrack by Savage Regime is just as good as the word of mouth would make you think. It pushes the genesis of sound hardware in ways that is probably never meant to go. But this is one tough game. There's a bunch of different weapons that pop up to help you out, but even your basic machine gun needs ammo refills, which means you always gotta be on the move. Between each level, you can redeem your collected dog tags to power up various attributes, but you can really only ever afford to upgrade one or two stats at a time. So you gotta choose carefully. I need to mention just how nice the physical cartridge version that Bitmap Bureau is selling directly is. No expense was spared, and the cart PCB was designed by Rene of DB Electronics, so you can buy it with confidence that it was correctly engineered and manufactured in a way that doesn't pose a threat to the console. While we're on the topic of the Genesis, I played a lot of shooters on the system this year. This is a bit of a shock, because while I like the genre in general, I've just never been very good at them, but I think I might be getting better with age. Probably most famous online as Mark from Classic Game Room's favorite game, Truxton from Toaplan was a challenging little vertical shooter. I'm not ashamed to say that I played through it on easy mode, which offered unlimited continues, but still offered significant challenge. Expect to be ambushed from behind fairly often and die before you know it. To me, there's two things that really make a shooter memorable, weapon loadout and music. There's some nice power-ups in this game, with the multi-directional blue lightning being my favorite. Of course, the skull-shaped smart bomb explosion is probably the most well-known image from the game. Music on the other hand, 
Yeah. I can take it or leave it. Oh, did I, I do it? it? Really? You, was you, that you, it? You have one, and Daguruva is defeated. <laughs> you may have escaped, but I'll get you next time. The other Toeplane shooter that I finally built up the courage to take on was Hellfire, or as I like to call it, Heckfire. I had the US version when I was a kid, but because I could never make it past the second level, I somehow decided that it was the most difficult shooter I'd ever played. Since Toeplane is mainly known for their vertically scrolling shooters, Hellfire doesn't seem to be all that well regarded. <laughs> It has some interesting play mechanics, where you cycle through weapons that can shoot in different directions, but other than that, there's not a whole lot to set it apart. My fear of Hellfire's difficulty stayed with me for years, until we were making the Mega SG video in March. I had to record footage from it in particular because it's known to have some sound speed issues on certain hardware revisions. In doing so, I realized that maybe it's not such an insurmountable game after all, and resolved to finish it by the end of the year. Although I wasn't able to do that. I think I'll be able to take it down in the early portions of 2020. One of the first games I bought for my Sega Genesis after getting it for Christmas in 1989 was Technosoft's Thunder Force 2. While I thought it was okay, the overhead segments definitely impacted the fun factor for me. Now, Thunder Force 3 is one of the defining shooters on the system, and I was finally able to get a copy of my own during our visit to Japan last year to shoot the M2 Complete Works documentary. This game trounces part 2 in every department, except maybe when it comes to the music. It's much more fast paced and has perhaps the best weapon lineup I've seen in any 16 bit shooter. It's also quite a bit easier, so much so that I was shocked to finish it during one of our live streams. This is the first game in the series that I've been able to complete. And a peaceful time came soon. It might be for a short time. Human, human beings, think about what you have done. <laughs> <laughs> And finally, Game Art's Silphied on the Sega CD was pitched by magazines back in the day as the Star Fox Killer. The similarities are undeniable, polygon graphics and the 3D point of view being the most obvious. But once you see it in motion, the comparison starts to break down. Silphied's backgrounds are primarily full motion video window dressing with very limited interactivity versus Star Fox more freely maneuverable environments. But as you probably know by now, I love me some rail shooters. And the space armadas and the trench runs makes for some larger than life encounters, even if it is mostly just for show. I beat a decent handful of old games for the first time this past year, but my favorite new to me game of 2019 is simply No Contest. The original Ape Escape for PlayStation is so clever and outstanding that I feel whether it's 2019 or 1999, its quality hasn't diminished in the slightest. In fact, I feel that playing Ape Escape two decades after its release may have only increased my appreciation for it, because there's a playfulness to the controls that simply does not feel like anything made today. Ape Escape was the first PlayStation game to require a dual analog controller. With free reign to use all of the features of the DualShock, it seems to me that Sony's new Japan studio must have approached their first game with a special gusto that can only be mustered when you feel you are doing something that could not previously be done without a very unique tool with untapped potential. Rather than gimmicky, the result is something that feels fresh in a, dare I say, Super Mario 64-esque kind of way. Really, I don't know what Sony had in mind when they included two sticks, because games like Spyro the Dragon simply left camera rotation on the shoulder buttons, so it took some number of years before right stick camera control became the rarely violated norm that it is today. But the team behind Ape Escape 
had a much bigger imagination for how the right stick might be used. The main goal of the game is of course catching all of the brainwashed monkeys, which can be located with the assistance of the monkey radar, which you direct with the right stick while running around, and then caught with the time net, which you swing in the direction pressed by the right stick. Other favorite gadgets of mine are the Sky Flyer, which you spin with the right stick and just feels fun to use, and the RC Car, which can be moved independently of Spike with the right stick and can access areas that he can't. There are even objects in the levels that can be manipulated in fun ways using both sticks, like the paddles in a canoe. You know what a huge N64 fan I am, so I wouldn't say this lightly, but I now honestly believe Ape Escape is the second best 3D platformer of its generation after Super Mario 64, even ahead of all of Rare's offerings. Modern games simply don't play like Ape Escape, and I just had so much fun with it. I hear that the PS2 sequels, which I've already bought, have similar control schemes, so I really can't wait to see where this unique platforming series went next but I have to bring up one last classic for the year. So if you remember in 2018, I started a tradition to pick a game that I would pledge to play through once a month for the whole year, with the goal of being to get to know it really well and increase my appreciation for it even more. I didn't exactly pull off the 12 months of playthroughs, but I did get pretty darn decent at Castlevania 1. Well, in 2019, I chose to play something a bit more outside the common list of NES favorites, Ninja Gaiden 3. You might have heard me rave before about how this is secretly the best Ninja Gaiden game, and I will stand firm by that statement. It has perhaps the best level design of any game on NES. There's just a flow to it that is unmatched, and the enemy and item placement is simply exquisite. It's a very, very learnable game. And once you figure out the best way to proceed through an area, it's just a beautiful thing. My idea for this year was to get really good at the far easier Famicom version and then graduate to the NES cartridge. The Famicom version is actually not all that difficult. The finely tuned level design makes it a pretty breezy romp with its infinite continues and generous checkpoints. The NES version plays like a hard mode. A few more enemies, you take more damage, limited checkpoints, and you only have five continues. Which, aside from having a pretty dumb story, is why it's usually considered the least favorite in the series. But it's actually a very well-balanced hard mode. While I didn't play the Famicom version nearly as many times as I intended to this year, I made one last minute effort on the final backloggery stream before Christmas to give the NES version my first serious go. It took a couple of attempts, but I finally beat it on my second to last life on the final continue of my third run of the night. What a game! And without a doubt, my most satisfying game accomplishment of 2019. It's not a big deal. It's just a small area that you're in. It's not a big deal. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> It's been well established at this point that the Switch is absolutely perfect for games with a more retro-inspired artistic vision. Maybe it has to do with the abundance of era-appropriate controllers on the system, or the fact that you generally don't have to worry about hardware capability. I might not be a gigantic racing fan, but I do love arcade racers. So when I heard that Horizon Chase Turbo was getting a physical release in the US, I had to jump on it. I heard it was a lot like OutRun, but I'm not so sure that the comparison is all that apt. Sure, it has a great look, runs silky smooth, and some great music, but I much prefer OutRun's level progression versus Horizon Chase's individual lap-based races. Of course, I haven't finished the World Tour mode, so maybe something like that will unlock later on. Still, it's great in short bursts and has a ton of content, so arcade fans should see if this scratches an itch.
Created by Japanese developer Astroport and published to Windows PC back in 2010, Gigantic Army made its way to consoles as a budget-priced eShop game in early 2019. I'm a big fan of the lumbering mech games, like Assault Suit Lanos, and while this was a nice homage, there's a number of factors that really keep it from being a must-play. First, whatever method they use to upscale the game to HD certainly doesn't do the graphics any favors, and is frankly a bit ugly. Secondly, the audio is incredibly overmodulated and blown out for whatever reason, although you can bring the audio level down to around 25 to compensate. The graphics, however, cannot be helped. Perhaps the best eShop game released this year with no physical release in sight is Devil Engine from Protoculture Games. And you thought I was done with shooting games for this episode. This one was recommended to me by viewers on our weekly live stream, and I was completely blown away by just how good it is. Although it seems to pull from a number of influences in the shooting game genre, such as Last Resort and Gate of Thunder, Devil Engine easily bears the closest resemblance to the Thunder Force series, right down to the soundtrack. Having the guts to start out with a Space Armada level earned my respect, but following it up with a future cityscape with saxophones blazing in the soundtrack earned my full attention. Who knows, maybe this is what Thunder Force 5 could have been if Technosoft didn't switch the polygons. One thing is very clear from frame one on Devil Engine. This was a work of passion, and the sprite work, animation, and soundtrack make it feel like it was made on a much bigger budget. And can I just say that I love the total commitment to using dithering for transparencies. The main gameplay hook lets you spend one of your combo levels to absorb enemy shots if you find yourself in a bind. There's also three styles of weapons, but if I had to nitpick, it would be that each of them are a little lackluster. Not in their overall look or usefulness, but just how they tend to feel, I don't know, insubstantial. They simply don't have the impact you'd expect after how unrelenting everything else is. Still, this is hardly an issue because you won't even have time to think about it once you're in the heat of battle. Like many of the greats, Devil Engine doles out extra continues the more you play. Other tweaks include the ability to change the color of enemy bullets and darken the background graphics if you're having trouble seeing enemies and their shots. There's actually an unprecedented level of customization not usually seen in shooters here. Anyway, although you might be tempted, don't rush out to get Devil Engine just yet. Due to a complicated legal situation between Protoculture Games and the publisher, Dangan Entertainment, no current sales will support the talents who created such an awesome game. So keep an eye on Protoculture Games' Twitter account to see if the situation is resolved in the future. Which brings us to one last game that I absolutely gotta talk about. I don't know, maybe it's crazy that I feel confident in saying that this game left such an impression on me from the first time I booted it up that I'm compelled to say that it was probably my favorite game that I played all year. Tango Project, responsible for 2017's excellent Wild Guns Reloaded, returns with yet another remaster slash remake of one of their classic games. Comprised of several key members who worked on the original, The Ninja Saviors, The Return of the Warriors is a pretty thorough update of The Ninja Warriors, or as it's called in Japan, The Ninja Warriors again. <laughs> Like Wild Guns, the SNES version has become prohibitively expensive these days, so this new version had me excited to see if it would be a total replacement for the original. An expanded playing field that is now closer to the original multi-monitor arcade original, an enhanced soundtrack, and a two-player simultaneous mode are really just the beginning. The core gameplay has also been significantly enhanced. Each character now has a bunch of new attacks at their disposal. It can be activated by holding different directions on the D-pad and pressing the attack button. 
This fundamentally changes how the game is played for the better. It's intuitive, fast, and fun. In addition to the original three characters, two completely new ninjas, Yaksha and Raiden, join the cast. This duo have a completely unique style, attacks, and moves, but don't feel out of place at all, even if Raiden is a hulking robot that is significantly larger than just about every enemy. They can be unlocked by beating the game a couple of times with any character. You can also unlock music from the arcade game and the SNES original. So yeah, it's safe to say that this is a complete and total improvement on the original in every way. Although Ninja Saviors can't actually be considered to be a new game, the pure joy I got out of it this year can't be understated. I'm curious to see what Tango Project will take on next, and if it'll be as good without an older work to build upon. Still, I wish that more developers would take their approach to remaking older games. This is well worth playing if you're a longtime fan, or just looking for some arcade action to pass the time. One of the biggest surprises for me in 2019 was just how much I got out of Super Mario Maker 2. Corey and I both have similar views on user-generated content. It just doesn't interest us that much. I have a huge amount of awe and respect for the incredible creations people have put together in games like Little Big Planet or Minecraft, but usually the thing that drives me in a game is completing the challenges that the developer put there themselves. So because of this, I actually skipped the original Super Mario Maker. I knew the game was very popular, but I just didn't think that the insane levels that people were showing off online looked very fun to play. So at first, I had no real intention to buy Super Mario Maker 2 either, but it enticed me with its so-called story mode that consists of Nintendo-made levels. I actually ended up buying it on a Sunday just before our weekly live stream, thinking if I was going to get any enjoyment out of user-generated levels, it would be in a stream context with people challenging me to play various levels, maybe ones that they made themselves. <laughs> oh, checkpoint. That's appreciated. Oh gosh. Oh gosh, no. No. <laughs> just no. What is this? While cynical as I was about the whole thing, it ended up being one of the most fun streams we've ever done. And that was all it took for me to realize that Super Mario Maker, or at least the sequel, was much more than a creativity tool. It was the freshest 2D Mario game I'd played since the 90s. And even some of the more difficult levels, or at least the ones that look super difficult, are more fun than I expected and make you feel kind of awesome when you catch the flow. <laughs> ah! Ah! Oh, I gotta do this. But I actually found myself most captivated by the levels that have light puzzle solving, adventuring, and even storytelling elements. Some levels I played were just so clever that I couldn't stop grinning. I even bothered to make a few levels of my own. One should be fun for RGB Masterclass fans, and another is a time travel themed level. I've got ideas for a few others too, and I would genuinely like to take the time to make them someday. Something that I've not really felt compelled to continue doing in a creative sort of game since, I don't know, maybe Mario Paint. Oh yeah, and the story mode. It's pretty fun too. It's good to see Nintendo's in-house level desires do things that are so much more original and compelling than what they would do with the new series. So even if you think user-generated content is not for you, give Super Mario Maker 2 a try. If the last time a 2D Mario game truly blew you away was on the Super Nintendo, I think you'll find that this is the true evolution of the 2D Mario formula that the By the Numbers new series never dared to be. I played several other 2019 releases, some of which were just okay, like Yoshi's Crafted World, which felt like a step back from the excellent Yoshi's Woolly World. 
others were really good, but didn't leave a lasting impression for reasons I can't really explain, like Astral Chain. I wish I had more to say about the remake of The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, but I think I'll return to the Game Boy Color version for any future replays. I felt like I was open to the new art style, but after reflecting on it a bit, I feel that the original 144p presentation demands so much from your imagination that it's hard for me to then accept someone else's vision of Coholent Island. But in terms of games that actually released in 2019, the remake of Resident Evil 2 is absolutely the one that I'm considering my game of the year. The original version of RE2 is a common pick for the fan favorite, but to me it's always fell short of Resident Evil 1, the original version, or the remake in terms of atmosphere and level design. And considering that the RE1 remake is often considered the best video game remake of all time, RE2 had a lot to live up to. Well, the team was clearly up to the challenge, giving us an entirely new game that is a perfect mix of surprise and familiarity, pushing both the original design and the Resident Evil series gameplay to new heights. While it is iconic, the original game's police station never felt terribly scary to me in the original version. But modern lighting and other technical and artistic touches have transformed the Raccoon City Police Department into a truly frightening place. And zombies are scary again. If you left one roaming a tight hallway, it could be a decision that you'll come to regret, but due to tight resources, you might just have to live with it. And when Mr. X shows up, everything changes. Clearly a prototype for Nemesis in 2020's Resident Evil 3, when Mr. X is around, you're constantly listening for his booming footsteps and trying to determine the best path to the item or room you're trying to reach. The police station becomes an open playing field with many possible routes, but none of which feel completely safe. In my first run, the West Wing hallways became completely overrun with zombies, which seriously limited my options. Throughout the whole game, the genuine danger of the environments combined with the freedom that you have to explore them just makes for an incredible experience and a new high bar for the series. For me, Resident Evil 2 just shot way up on my list of favorite Resident Evil games. Well, there you have it. There are a bunch of other games that we'd have liked to have mentioned, but well, gotta draw the line somewhere. 2019 was a challenging year with a lot of big documentary projects taking up a ton of our time, but we also figured out ways to optimize our workflows, balance our lives a bit better, and make time for games and relaxation. We expect 2020 to be an extremely prolific year for my life in gaming, with much more regular content, including the long-awaited five-part documentary series featuring some of the retro tech community's best and brightest, and the very much overdue return of the RGB 200 series. So here's to another year of videos, tech, and of course, just playing some more games. <laughs>